This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, um, so I'm going to be talking about our, our diploid and triploid hemp cultivar trials that we've been doing these past two years. If you were here last year, then you got to see um, year one in the field, and then this is our, our year two trial in these first two rows uh, here. Um, so let's just kind of go over some basics. What is the difference between a diploid uh, hemp cultivar and a triploid hemp cultivar? Well, it's the number of sets of chromosomes that the plant has. So, so most hemp, just like humans, has two sets of chromosomes. One that they get from their pollen parent, from their dad, and one that they get from their seed parent, from their mom. But there's kind of some, uh, some fancy uh, chemical manipulation that we can do that we can um, make a different number of chromosomes in the plant. Um, so this is something that Oregon CBD did. Um, if you look at the handout, which you can find on the QR code on uh, the agenda for the day, uh, you can see that what they did is they, they treated some of their individuals with a chemical called colchicine, which doubles the number of chromosomes. Um, so instead of being a diploid, two sets of chromosomes, they become a tetraploid, four sets of chromosomes. And then when you cross a tetraploid, 4X, with a diploid, 2X, you get a triploid 3x. Does that make sense to everyone? You're tracking perfectly. Great. Uh, so, so next question, why would we even want triploids? Like what is, is the value of triploids? And I'm gonna give you a hint. Uh, things like seedless watermelon and bananas are also triploid, um, naturally or man-made. And the benefit in some species of being triploid is that they do not usually produce viable seeds. So when seeds are produced in the plant, the plant needs to divide up the chromosomes into different seeds uh, that then get pollinated by pollen. But you can imagine that dividing three sets of chromosomes does not go as well as dividing two or four because three doesn't divide evenly. Uh, so it's much harder for these plants uh, to make seed and often the triploids are seedless, are sterile. Um, so people were interested in this from a hemp perspective because if you're producing cannabinoids, you want unpollinated female inflorescences. Um, so pollen management is something that a lot of growers have to deal with, something that drives people to do indoor cultivation, um, to really need to, to manage the production of um, males in their field and also uh, grain and fiber production in a several mile radius because hemp and cannabis is wind pollinated and that pollen can travel really great distances. Uh, so the idea was that if we could have these triploid cultivars, they would be seedless. You could grow them without the fear of pollination. And to test that, us, uh, along with um, our colleagues at North Carolina State and the University of Kentucky, decided to do a trial where we planted these diploid and triploid cultivars at sites that were pollen-free and also sites that were pollen-challenged. So this is our pollen challenge site. You can see our green and fiber planting right behind it. There's a ton of pollen there. So if these plants were going to get pollinated, we're giving them the, the best opportunity to get pollinated here. Um, so we're interested in comparing the diploid and triploid cultivars at our pollinated and pollen-free sites. And if you look on our handout, um, I'm presenting some of the data from our sites last year. Um, really, really exciting and interesting data. Um, so the diploids produce seed as expected. Um, interestingly, the triploids also produced some seed, dramatically less seed, but some seed still. Um, so as a proportion of the total biomass, our diploids produced you know, 40 or 50% of the total biomass was seed, whereas our triploids, it was generally less than 10%, as low as 1%, even in a pollinated environment. So a pretty dramatic reduction in, in seed. And that also corresponds with um, the, the, the cannabinoid measurements. So we measured cannabinoids at three weeks after the initiation of flowering, five weeks after the initiation of flowering, and also bulk stripped floral biomass. And um, for our diploid varieties, we saw significant reductions in cannabinoid content at our pollinated sites. So more seed, less cannabinoids, probably a combination of things like the, the total biomass being diluted by seed biomass, which is very low in cannabinoids because the cannabinoids are not produced in the seeds. But if we look at our triploids, at our pollinated and pollen-free environments, they produced about the same amount of cannabinoids. So we didn't see that dilution effect, even though there was a little bit of seed production. Um, so 
I think that's all I, I really want to say. You can see more on the handout and I, I would be happy to take any questions or we can walk around for a minute or two before we have to go to Luis and uh, Jamie's talk right across the street here. Larry has a question. Why are those plants so small? Oh, that's a great question, Larry. The, the question from Larry is why are those plants so small? If you were here last year, you may uh, remember that the plants were much bigger last year. And this was because, um, so these are, these are transplanted hemp plants. So we grew them in the greenhouse and you know, you grow them in the greenhouse with the anticipation that your field is gonna be ready when the plants are ready in the greenhouse. Unfortunately, we had a very wet June and this field did not have plastic. It was not plowed up. We couldn't get the tractors in here. So we weren't able to transplant that initial set of plants that would have been, you know, probably this big by now. So what we did is we planted a second round of seedlings, which were delayed about a month. And, and these are those, so they're significantly smaller than, than one would expect. Um, but we should be able to get still good data off of them, uh, even though the plants are smaller. Any other questions? Yes, Tyler. Yeah, I'm just curious, are all of these plants triploids out here that we're gonna look at, or do you have some comparison like in that's a great, great question, Tyler. Um, so Tyler asked if all of the plants are diploid or all of the plants are triploid or if there's, there's mixtures. So the diploid triploid trial is actually just a very small portion of this field. Um, we have a lot of other exciting stuff that I, I don't get to talk about in the rest of the field. Uh, so these first two rows are the diploid triploid trial. And we have three uh, pairs of diploid and triploid cultivars. So three diploids and three triploids. Uh, and they're replicated in five plant fl plots four times. So there are both diploids and triploids in the field. Yes. Um, any other questions? Yes? What, um, what's the effect of the triploidy on the vegetative growth or other aspects of the plant growth? That's a great question. So the question was, uh, does the being triploid compared to being diploid um, increase maybe the biomass or the concentration of cannabinoids? Uh, so based on the data from last year, I don't think we saw evidence of that. Um, you know, in the, in the pollinated trials, obviously the diploids produce seed and the triploids did not. Um, so there was a, a difference in concentration there, but overall, I don't think we see an effect of triploids being, you know, larger than diploids or producing 50% more cannabinoids in an unpollinated field. Yes, Tyler. Um, have you worked at all? You mentioned tetraploids as well. Have you tried to grow out any tetraploids? Uh, so Tyler's asking if we have grown any tetraploids here. Um, and to my knowledge, we have not grown any tetraploids here. Um, that would be really interesting to do, but our, our, our lab has not gotten into the whole culture scene, chromosome doubling deal. We're mostly reliant on other uh, people who have done that work and we're just evaluating those. Alrighty, um, so we got. It is a good question though, uh, whether triploidy and fiber hemp, for example, might increase the yield. You would have to create it as an F1 hybrid, obviously, because it wouldn't make any seed. But do you have to plant it as a clone then? Or? No, no, you you would cross a diploid with a tetraploid uh, and that would create the triploid seed. And then you just take that seed and plant that seed. But obviously those plants are then sterile. So you have to cre do that hybrid cross every year to make that seed, potentially. Yeah, so that's a, a great point that Larry's making about there could be applications for triploids in other market classes of hemp, including fiber hemp. Um, depending on what the effect of the extra set of chromosomes does on the, the other traits in the plant. And the possible benefit for fiber would be what? Often triploids show increased yield. They're bigger than diploids. Right. So we've done a lot of work on willow. Most of our commercial willow cultivars, which are for biomass production, are triploids. Is there any work on hybrid vigor with hemp? Uh, so the question was, is there any work on hybrid vigor for hemp? So just a, a background for those of you unfamiliar with hybrid vigor. Um, in other crops, um, the canonical system used to make hybrids is you generate two inbred lines. I'll just use corn as an example. So you can um, take two uh, very different corn lines. You can self them until they're very inbred and then you can use them to make a hybrid. And then that hybrid shows hybrid vigor or heterosis. So the progeny perform much better than both of the parents. 
Um, so this is much more challenging to do in hemp because hemp is uh, generally outcrossing. If it's dioecious, it's an obligate outcrosser, so it's much harder to make inbred lines. Um, there is some work on it from groups like Oregon CBD. Also, our uh, group published a paper last year looking at um, different hybrid families of hemp um, all crossed to a single common parent and how those different hybrids performed. Um, so there definitely is uh, work on it, but it, it is more challenging in a dioecious species than a, a normal selfing species. Yep? Are you noticing any differences in the flower structure when you increase ploidy? Uh, so the question was, are there any differences in flower structure with an increase in ploidy? Um, I personally have, have not noticed that, but that's also anecdotal. I don't know if people have um, done you know, inflorescence architecture quantification and then proper statistics to test that hypothesis, but it would be definitely an interesting hypothesis to test. They do flower later though, right? Um, so so in these, these diploid triploid comparisons, we do see that the triploids generally flower later, um, which could be an effect of being triploid. It also could be a effect of uh, flowering time genes that are segregating in these populations. So when Oregon CBD makes their uh, their hybrids, they use an auto flower parent as their pollen parent, um, so they can, well, for, for a variety of reasons, but um, that is uh, one of the, the things that is uh, just innately part of all of their hybrids. Um, so in, in diploids, um, the hybrids have one dose out of two from that auto flower parent, but in uh, triploids, it's one dose out of three. So if this flowering time is, is dosage dependent, it could be a, a, an effect of the, the genes in addition to the ploidy. Um, Alrighty, I, I think we're running out of time here, but um, um, I'll be around if anybody has any questions and I'm excited to hear what Luis and Jamie have to talk about at the next stop. Are you gonna speak here? This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.